prayer if we could. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with us your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, in the introductions, you learned my name was Deacon Tom, Tom Busick. And um, my Crucio, my fourth day, started about 7,181 days ago, <laughs> which is nine, 19 years, 7 months, and 27 days. Uh, it was a milestone in my life, my journey, um, part of what got me into a collar, and not, the, not a small part either. But when I was asked to speak, <laughs> come to a meeting, I was asked to speak uh, about these three chapters. I thought that was, that was interesting. Okay, I like Matthew Kelly and like his work and enjoyed a lot of his things. But as I got deeper into it, um, I recognized that the chapters that you assigned to me are really a linchpin in this book. If you've read through the whole book, you understand what I'm talking about. Because even in the, in the second chapter, which is chapter 23, he even say, he states, I might as well tell you now, we have been dancing all around it. Jesus wants to turn your life upside down. And when I, when I read the book, and I got to these three chapters, it is a call. It is actually making a call. So <clears throat> I said, okay, I usually won't speak the way I'm speaking to you now. I will usually speak like this, okay? Every word written out because I'm afraid of two things. One is saying something incredibly stupid, or two, preaching heresy and someone's gonna to go to hell because of what they said. Okay, so I usually write everything out, study the daylights out of it. Well, I did that this time. I started down that road, and I ended up saying, you know, time to put your big boy pants on, and let's just turn it over to the Holy Spirit. You've studied, you know the material, uh, you've put your information together, and this morning I got up, about five o'clock, and I says, wait a minute, I've got work to do. <laughs> I'm not finished yet. So I said, well, look, why not, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'll we'll turn something on here for you. Why not take advantage of, and I'm gonna screw up your, your camera, I'm sorry. Why not take advantage of what's going on and what's available? And we said earlier, technology is great when it works, but it'll come, it'll come. Um, in the first chapter, Matthew Kelly starts off by saying, God has a mighty, awesome, wonderful transformation in mind for you. And that's, these three chapters are focused on life-changing transformation. Uh-huh. There they are. <laughs> I just told the ladies that I grouped with, and it's not public knowledge yet, but we are, my wife and I are moving in this next year, we're going to be moving back to Pittsburgh. And that's why we're moving back to Pittsburgh, okay? Um, but that's not what I wanted to show you. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to show you is why not go to the source? As we talk about these three, why not listen for a little bit to the man who wrote them? 
and what he has to say. First we spend so much of our time sort of tweaking. You know, we pray for tweaking. Oh, dear God, please tweak this, and dear God, please tweak that, and, and tweak my husband, God, and, and tweak my kids, God, and tweak their soccer coach, and, and tweak our pastor, and, and tweak the politicians, and tweak this situation, and, and tweak that situation. And, and then, of course, very often I think we wonder, you know, why doesn't God answer our prayers? The answer is really simple. God's not in the business of tweaking. God's in the business of transformation. You know, God has a, a great, mighty, awesome, powerful transformation in mind for you and a great powerful mighty transformation in mind for me god god is the king of transformation and he, he he desires transformation for us because he wants us to have an incredible joy he wants us to have an incredible peace he wants us to have an incredible happiness one of the great challenges of our spiritual life is is to switch from tweaking to transformation and i think the sad truth is that most of us never once in our lives have we prayed a prayer of transformation most of us never once in our lives have, have come to God and said, all right, God, whatever you want. Everything's on the table. I'm 100% available. Transform me. Transform my life. Take what you want to take. Give what you want to give. I'll do whatever you ask me to, God. You see miracles in your own life? Pray that prayer. Because I can promise you one thing. Never once in the history of the world did God not answer that prayer. God answers prayers of transformation every single time. St. Padre Pio once said, The life of a Christian is nothing but a perpetual struggle against self. There is no flowering of the soul to the beauty of its perfection except at the price of pain. If we think about any transformation, it always requires great sacrifice and it's almost always painful. But if we focus on the main goal of keeping our eyes on Jesus and his incredible outcome of the transformation he has in mind for us, he will sustain us through all trials and tribulations we will have along the way. What will be the hardest thing about letting God transform you in your life? together with you and we are going to have a participatory time today. You didn't think I would get that out, did you? Probably. <laughs> um, by that I mean I would like very much for you to participate in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, let's pray together. That prayer, it's in the book, but if you don't have the book, I have it right there for you. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving Father, here I am. I trust that you have an incredible plan for me. Transform me. Transform my life. Everything is on the table. Take what you want to take, and give what you want to give. Transform me into the person you created me to be so I can live the life you envision for me. I hold nothing back. I am 100% available. How can I help? Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, something that happens when you slow down and understand what it is that you're saying, what it is that you're asking for, and Matthew Kelly, as we'll see a little bit later on, Matthew Kelly is, a, is a, an expert at asking questions, asking good questions that make you stop and think. But in this prayer itself, everything is on the table. Really? Are we willing to do that? Everything. One of the stories that, that come up in the uh, 23rd chapter is the, the, uh, the wealthy young man. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Are you willing to put everything on the table? 
If I were asked to do that, would I be able to do that? Take what you want to take. Give what you want to give. Transform me into the person you created me to be. Do we even know what that is? What does that look like? Transformation. Um, in the early church, they used to call consecration the bread and water into the blood and body of Jesus Christ. They used to call that transformation. It was Thomas Aquinas who came along and said, transformation, trans change, formation, the form. The form is bread and wine. After the consecration, the form is still bread and wine. The substance, what it actually is, is the body and blood. And that's where this, the term transubstantiation came from. Change the substance of that bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. If you want to see miracles in your own life, pray the prayer of transformation. The next chapter, the Upside Down. Still, you can find these on the web. Somewhere deep inside, we know that Jesus wants to turn our lives upside down. And maybe not every aspect of our life, but certainly at least one or two aspects of our life. The truth is, Jesus wants to turn your marriage upside down. He wants to turn your parenting upside down. He wants to turn your family upside down. He wants to turn your work upside down. He wants to turn your career or your business upside down. He wants to turn your parish and your school upside down. He wants to turn your personal finances upside down. He wants to turn your health and well-being upside down. He wants to turn your ideas and opinions upside down. Jesus wants to turn your life upside down. If you let him, you'll be happier than you ever thought possible in this lifetime. If you let him. But that's the great challenge, right? Is, is to allow Jesus into our lives. And I think sometimes we sort of keep Jesus at arm's length because we don't want him to get too close because we know he wants to transform us and transform our lives. The truth is that's a, a, a scary reality. I think that frightens us sometimes. And, and that's okay, and it's important that we acknowledge that so that we can get beyond it. The truth is we're all the rich young man. You know, our, our wealth might not be worldly wealth, but we're all the rich young man in, in something, in some way. We all have riches. And, and so we can identify with this young man there's a number of things, I think we've heard the story a thousand times, but there's a number of things about the rich young man that really strike me. One is that yeah, he proactively sought Jesus out. Okay, Jesus didn't come looking for him. The rich young man proactively sought Jesus out, which suggests to us that, you know, he, he wanted to be a good person. He wanted to strive spiritually. He wanted to grow in his faith, and he, he proactively sought Jesus out. I think the question that raises for us is, are we proactively seeking Jesus in our lives, or are we just sort of stumbling upon Jesus at different moments in different experiences of our lives? To be honest with you, my humble experience with Christ took place during a drive to work only a month after my first child was born. The love I was experiencing as a first-time father was something I could not put words to. During that drive, I caught myself contemplating John 3.16, and then I had a thought that there was no way I could ever sacrifice my son like God did. This thought changed my life. It was during this moment I took my role as a husband and a father much more seriously. Soon after, though, I discovered that believing in Christ was more than just words. The pursuit of Christ as a husband and father continues to be challenging for me, but I've begun to learn that becoming the best version of myself won't happen without encounters that prescribe change in my life. 
Each new day brings a new opportunity for me to welcome Christ into my life. And the fact that I'm still breathing leads me to believe I have many encounters still to come. Do you look for those opportunities? What's preventing you from making yourself available to God? How many times do we have that opportunity? Transformation and it's so much fun to watch him work. Um, we had a CCD uh, class last Wednesday night and we're doing the EDGE program for the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, which means they're all together in the gym and there's a core team of us, uh, there's about eight of us, and some, a different one of us takes that week. The program is kind of orchestrated for you, so you've got an outline and some suggestions on what to do and so forth. Um, I had this past week. So we went through, and then it was let the fire fall. I loved it, absolutely wonderful. Um, but one of the things that it asks for, it says, have a core team member give a, uh, a special uh, brief story to share with the youth about how Christ has transformed their life. So I went to two people. The first one says, you know, I've got all this stuff going on at home and I'm not going to be able to be there. I says, okay. I went to the second one, Dynamite. And she says, you know, I had last week and I gave all kinds of witness and I've got next week and I'm going to do witness again. I'm going to run out of witnesses here. <laughs> okay? So I went to a third one, left a message. Went to a fourth one and she said, yeah, I'll do it. Well, the third one came back and said, yeah, I'll do it. And the third one hasn't been that, that involved in, uh, she's not a cursiista, so, but she hasn't been that involved. Um, I says, okay, it's supposed to be five minutes, a brief, brief witness on how Christ, an instance where Christ transformed your life. And she stood up, not polished, but she just stood up and told about the time when she was pregnant with her first child. And um, a friend of hers had a child several months before, the, before this point in time. So the child was, uh, was maybe four or six months old and the baby died. Sudden infant death. At the crib at night. Just died. She's telling the story and the kids are going, wow, okay, this is something that's pretty real. So she says when she had her baby, she was scared to death for the rest of the pregnancy. And when she had her baby, she couldn't sleep. She would be in every half hour, every hour, to check the baby, see if it was breathing, look for its chest moving, and she wasn't getting any sleep at all. And this went on for a couple of months. And she said, finally, one night I got up, and there was somebody in my room. And she says, I don't claim that it was Jesus himself. It was an angel, it was somebody in my room. Loved me, told me, go back to bed, your child is going to be fine. She went back to bed, slept like a baby, and from that point on, never had any concerns about whether a child was going to make it through the night. And she said, spiritually, that changed her dramatically. She had, she had a feeling of closeness to a deity, to our God, to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit that she had never had before. The kids were just sitting there with their mouth open and going, wow, you actually were visited by an angel? Hmm. Talking about angels, I, TMIY every Saturday morning, last Saturday morning, we were talking about angels for some reason at our table. At TMIY, you go through uh, video presentation, you have a little fellowship video presentation, and then small table, small group talks, just talking about the, the video. And we somehow we got on angels, and 
one of the fellows at the table said, that would scare the big guy. He said, that would scare the daylights out of me to see an angel. I says, well, go to the Adoration Chapel. He says, they were there all the time. And then all of a sudden, my phone, which I hadn't turned off, started, my phone rang. And everybody jumped at the table. I turned it off. But then he says, do you know what that is? That, that tune that you have on there for your ring? No, I had no idea what it was. It was a tune. Says, That's called Bad to the Bone. <laughs> Whoa. He says, we ain't going to mess with the deacon anymore. <laughs> anyway, um, this is one of the places where I would like to invite you to consider. What was one of those transformation times in your life? And I'm going to ask anybody who will volunteer to come up and share. We have one that was shared in a small group, so I know there's one out there, but I'm sure there are many more. Um, anyone who would care to share that particular moment, and it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about your whole world changed, the total transformation, but there are small pieces of transformation that happen in our lives. Now, not all at once, but who wants to be first? Come on. <laughs> Talk about not being prepared. <laughs> um, last Sunday, uh, coming into church, uh, there were two boxes left at the entrance area. And uh, my guess is, and this is totally a guess, that uh, somebody had died and the family was, um, didn't want to keep these items and books, uh, and they put them in the church for other people to take. And um, I ran into Yoli that morning, and she said, you know, they would be great for our women's weekend. Um, she was going to put it in her trunk, but she was going to be mass right away, and I was, I was putting my mass to the second mass afterwards. So I went back and I put it in the trunk of my car. And um, when I uh, got home and I started going through all the books and the statues and stuff in there, um, there was this beautiful, large crucifix. And uh, the corpus must be porcelain. And I took it. And I hung it in my little chapel area. And um, a day or two later, I was praying in front of it. And, um, um, and asking for forgiveness from God uh, for a, a sin that I had committed. And um, this corpus, as gorgeous as it is, has a slight flaw, where the body is just a little bit off of the cross itself. So the hand actually hangs below the cross. And in this prayer for mercy that I had, I saw, uh, and the Jesus on the crucifix uh, was not dead yet, so his head was still up, but his he face was looking this way, his eyes were open. And I had this vision as I'm praying of the hand coming down towards me off the cross, and the Holy Spirit as the dove came out off of his hand towards me and forgiveness for my sin. And um, I, I can't remember the sin anymore. Uh, so the, the forgiveness, everything was there. It, it, it was um, a very special, special moment there. Thank That's you. It. Those those moments, they happen and sometimes we let them slip by. Sometimes they get away from us. Um, but I know, I know we've all had, anybody else? Of one in particular that they want to share. Bill? <clears throat> I don't think I need a microphone. Um, these moments, these moments, she wants to oh, she wants to I'm not doing it yet. Um, I, I forgot about the camera. Um, these moments that happen, it, it, it's like a, a culmination, you know. To pick out one and say it really changed 
your life. For me, anyway, it's difficult to do. Um, I don't know how far it's changed. Uh, my wife could probably tell you better than I can. Um, but there's, there's situations that happen in your life that just go back to time and time again. This particular one, and I've, I've only shared this in a couple places, um, but I was at a Bible study and, and sort of the same thing. We were talking about events in our life that maybe changed us. And I wasn't going to say anything, and it was, it was really strange because I felt a tap on my shoulder. But I was sitting next to Joan and against the wall, and, and she didn't tap my shoulder. So it was like, like, like a, real, a real hand tap my shoulder. So I thought, well, that's an indication I should say about what I'm thinking. Um, but I was in Mass. And at this time, um, we had been talking quite a bit about the numbers, you know, and how they were failing at Mass, and people weren't there. And uh, it sort of sometimes gets you depressed when you turn around, and it's like, you know, where is everybody? Because uh, we know that there's a lot of prisoners out there. Why aren't they here? Um, and I can't explain if I closed my eyes or if they were open. But I was sort of in prayer about this. And then when I opened my eyes, the church was full um, with kids and families. And, um, and they were joyful. Everybody was joyful and at peace and celebrating. And all these feelings and emotions at one time. And I was feeling the same thing. And it was one of the most peaceful moments I've ever experienced. And I can't tell you how long this went on. And then it was gone. The people weren't there anymore. They, oh, and all the people were of a glow. You know, like, a, like we would assume happiness is in heaven. But they were all a glow. And then they were gone. And a few people that I've mentioned this to said, well, that's Congregation of Saints. You saw the Congregation of Saints. And I, I never thought of that. So it was an experience that I go back to from time to time because it's, it's, uh, it's a feeling that you, you can't explain. You know? I mean, I've had joys in my life. I've been very blessed. But that was, that was a, a moment it was so out of this world <laughs> experience that it's something that you all will never forget. So, that's it. Thank you. You all are making this easy on me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I have a terrible memory. And these things happen in my life. I'm sure they've happened much more than I recall. There is one in particular that I recall, and some of you I know have heard it. But I was in chapel, and I was doing the Ignatius type of meditation where you put yourself right there in your mind, in your imagination, you put yourself there. And I was sitting on a grassy hillside, and Jesus was sitting just up the hill from me. And he had just finished telling me the parable of the prodigal son. And we were just kind of sitting there thinking about what he had just said. And then I turned and I looked up at him and I said, who do you say that I am? And I still get chills when I repeat that. I am turning his words back on him. That's what he asked his apostles. Well, um, it wasn't but maybe a few weeks later where a gentleman whose brother was a Jesuit uh, was visiting him and he called me to come over because I said I wanted to talk to him. And I talked to this Jesuit priest about this experience that I had. And of course, his question to me was, what did Jesus say to you? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I was afraid to listen because I thought I knew what he was going to say and I didn't want to hear it. 
Well, that put me into meditation for a while, thinking about it. And I hope I figured it out. Because this was before I ever went into formation for the diaconate. But um, still listening, still converting, still transforming uh, every day. One of the ones, one of the, um, and you talk about uh, the next one, the next chapter. It's called The Gap. Let's hear from Matthew first. I had this exercise I do at church on Sunday. You know, after the priest reads the gospel, uh, or the deacon, I ask myself, you know, if I just live this one gospel reading 100%, how much would my life change? I get the same answer every Sunday. Radically. My life would change radically. If I just lived last Sunday's gospel 100%, my life would change radically. Not the whole gospel, not the whole New Testament, not the whole Bible, not the whole catechism, not the whole church's teachings, but if I just lived last Sunday's gospel 100%, my life will change radically. There's a gap between my life and the gospel, and it's a pretty big gap. And I guess the first thing to recognize is, is the gap. And then we can work on God, you know, to close the gap. And we come to church on Sunday to work on the gap. You know, we, we spend time reading the scriptures to work on the gap. We try to do good deeds for other people to work on the gap, to close the gap. But it's a big gap, it's a pretty big gap. And, when we measure our lives against the gospel, we discover that gap. The problem is, is that we tend to measure our lives against a lot of other things. And when we do that, I think one of the great dangers is we can fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I'm a pretty good Christian. I mean, compared to that person, or compared to my neighbor who's doing this stupid thing, or compared to these people on TV, I'm a pretty good Christian. This is the sin of comparison, where we compare ourselves to something else or someone else in order to feel good about ourselves and the real problem with this comparison is that it stops us from growing. It stops us from accepting God's invitation to grow and be transformed, to change in the, in the beautiful and incredible ways that God wants to grow us, to change us, to transform us into that incredible person He created us to be, that, that best version of ourselves. I think about the Christiesta community. And that witness that you just heard, I'll share more on that in just a moment. I know that God is the only one who can give me true and pure happiness. Happiness that is not fleeting. Despite knowing this, I find myself resisting this gift and then asking why. The reality is, beautiful happiness that is promised to us by God requires work remaining close to Him and living our lives according to the Gospels. I resist because I grow lazy in my spiritual life, viewing a relationship with God as too much work. I always come back to the same realization. No efforts are too big or too hard in exchange for happiness from God. I love to think of the words by St. Paul the Cross when I need motivation and encouragement. Happy the heart that keeps itself on the cross. Happiness from God is always waiting for us, and it is never too late to accept it. Take time to reflect on today's question. Why do you resist the happiness that God wants to fill you with? Like I said, I uh, see the gap, and I think, wait a minute, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, folks who are taking their faith seriously, people who are devoted. And then I read a quote by St. Faustina in her diary, where she says, in one of her visions, the Lord told her, if I were to show you your sinfulness, you would die of horror. This was St. Faustina. How far am I from being St. Faustina? So, okay, we all have some room to go. But let's, I have, uh, pass over back. 
the, uh, the prayer that we did earlier is on one side of this, but then there are a bunch of questions on the other side. And if you would, How do you fill the gap? If you recall, he gave us four areas to fill the gap. Read the four Gospels, practice the prayer process, deny yourself, and practice a spontaneous prayer. That's the next four chapters, so I'm not going to take somebody's thunder on that. But if you would, take a moment. These aren't going to be collected. These are for your use. But take a moment, if you have a pen or pencil, respond to these questions. And we'll go through them one at a time. The first one, how well do, you, do we know Jesus? Who does he say that you are? The question is, are we proactively seeking Jesus in our lives, or do we just seek him in times of need? Are we proactively seeking Jesus? If you're anything like me, it's sometimes yes. And sometimes there's a Steelers game on, you know? <laughs> the next question. Now, we all have those things we don't, or we do or we don't do, that we know we could handle better. The question is, what aspect of your life are you discontent with? What is there in your life that you're just not happy with? The next question, and remember what Kelly said about tweaking. Are you willing to have God completely overhaul your life and totally transform you? I don't need transforming, I just need to change this little thing or that little thing. Really? The woman with the hemorrhage for 12 years said, if I could just touch his cloak, I will be made well. When was the last time you went out of your way to get close to Jesus? And we all have fears and foibles, and our faith may not have moved any mountains lately, but What's preventing you from making yourself totally available to God? What's in your way? What's preventing you from making yourself totally available to God? Now, Jesus has been transforming lives of men and women and children in every corner of the world. He wants to radically transform you and your life. Are you ready? If not, what do you need to do that you would feel that you're ready? Many times, if not always, change or conversion comes at a cost. What will be the hardest thing about letting God transform you and your life? And finally, in this last question, um, really kind of puts it all together. What aspect of your life are you discontent with? At different times, we all want our lives to change. How would you like your life to be different one year from now?
like I said, these, these three chapters to me were a real hinge pin in the book. Everything before this talked about qualities and, and issues and factors. After this, it talks about some of the how-to, but these three chapters talk about what. What are you going to do with your life? Oh, there was a quote in there. There was a quote in there. I can't even find it for you. Because it, uh, it reminds me of a story I once heard about twins in utero. One turns to the other and says, I wonder if there's life after birth. The reality of life on earth is astounding when compared to life in the womb. And I suspect that in the same way, the afterlife is astounding compared to life here on earth. God bless you. Thank you very much. Nate Morris. Okay.